Okay, so Alan Bates has commented that if the authorities aren't going to act, then he thinks he and the other affected sub-postmasters may consider private prosecutions. And that's very interesting, and I'll cover briefly what exactly that entails. I mean, I've done a fuller video on um, everything you need to know about private prosecutions, and I'll link that at the end. But what I'm also interested about is whether they will consider what we call um, proceeds of crime confiscation proceedings, which is where you effectively seize not just the money that the offender profited as a result of their wrongdoing, but it's basically everything that they took through their books while they were acting criminally. Um, so it's, you know, it's, as the authorities say, it is not confiscation in the way that a schoolboy would understand it. So first of all, private prosecutions. Yeah, anybody can bring one. Um, there are some offences that require the offence of uh, sort of the consent of the Attorney General, um, but that doesn't include things like fraud or even perverting the course of justice. So if they want to, they can bring those proceedings. How do they do that? Uh, they go to the magistrate's court and they lay an information. Um, there's no standard way of doing that, although magistrate's courts tend to have their own standard forms now. And you literally put um, who you are as the potential prosecutor and who you want to prosecute. You set out the statement of the offence, you know, specifically what sections you are charging them under or what common law offence is. Then you set out the particulars of the offence. In other words, you go into the detail. So it would be something like, you know, fraud, um, contrary to the Theft Act 1968, particulars being that they dishonestly brought proceedings against people which resulted in money being, you know, people being convicted and their assets being seized and returned to the post office. Even though now it seems clear that all these losses were purely imaginary. They were just created by, you know, literally the ghost in the machine, the bugs in the software. There are civil proceedings to recover things when that happens. Um, usually we call it unjust enrichment. Unjust enrichment is where somebody ends up with your property, whether it be money or goods or anything that counts as property, and they're just not entitled to it. And the good thing about in unjust enrichment is you don't have to show that they did anything wrong or anything. Um, you just say, you know, we don't, don't care how you got it, it's not yours, I want it back. I mean, classic examples are you got the cash machine one day, you withdraw £20, it gives you £200, can you keep it? No, you can't. Um, the bank can seize the balance of the 180 because that is an unjust enrichment because it's not your money. Uh, you know, if you're overpaid by your employer or even if it's just somebody, you know, somebody gave you some money under false pretenses. You know, they, they thought you were the owner of something so they bought it off you and it turns out you're not the owner. Um, then again, you have been unjustly enriched because you have, you know, no basis for keeping that money. Um, but how does it work with confiscation proceedings? Well, first of all, let's assume that they go ahead with the private prosecutions. These are serious offences, so they'd start in the magistrate's court, but unless both the bench and the defendants agreed, um, then, you know, that it's suitable for, to be tried in the magistrate's court. And a fraud of this seriousness, especially if it's perverting the course of justice, wouldn't be. It would be transferred to the Crown Court. Um, you know, you can instruct lawyers to conduct the proceedings. Now, one thing we've heard about is people say, oh, why didn't Keir Starmer come in and take over the private prosecutions that the post office brought? Well, you can only take over as the CPS a private prosecution if you are invited to by either the Crown, uh, sorry, the prosecutor, whether it's the Crown or a private prosecutor, where the defendant, the judge, or what we call the legal advisor, the former court clerks in the magistrate's court, they can all say, mm, hang on a minute, not really sure this is suitable for a private prosecution, maybe we should let the DPP know, see if they want to take over. And the DPP can come in and they can, I mean, you, you know, they can just say, I, we are taking over pr proceedings. There's no test that they have to pass or anything. They can just step in and say, we are now proceeding with this. Uh, they can choose to go ahead with the case or they can discontinue it. Um, if they do make a decision you don't agree with, so if you're the prosecution and they don't, uh, and they discontinue, you can judicially review the decision to discontinue. Similarly, if you're a defendant and they don't discontinue, you can JR the decision not to discontinue. Um, usually though, as we've said before, 
courts are always reluctant to interfere with sort of you know these sorts of decisions but um, you know unless there's any good reason to discontinue the cps are told no just let it run its course you know they don't just step in just because it's a serious case if they think the prosecuting party is capable of proceeding properly and fairly um, then they'll let them get on with it i mean the only advantage in getting the cps involved is then you can get all the police involved and all the investigations so you know in terms of getting material and investigating um, then perhaps it's easier although in this case you know most of the evidence is um, already out there so yeah then it it goes to trial if there is a conviction then people are sentenced in the normal way the good thing about bringing a private prosecution is if it's only in the magistrate's court if the prosecutor succeeds then they can claim the full cost of the prosecution and the investigation from the defendant if the defendant succeeds they can't claim anything from the prosecutor they can claim from central funds but they can only recover at legal aid rates not what they've actually spent if however it goes to the crown court even if the prosecution fails if the court decides well it was reasonable for you to bring this prosecution the prosecutor can receive their costs from central funds so you know i always say actually always consider private prosecution as an alternative to civil litigation just because of the cost implications especially for things like harassment um you know where it, it basically you can get an injunction uh, for harassment in either criminal or civil proceedings now the good thing about if you bring criminal proceedings say you bring criminal proceedings for harassment and the prosecution is unsuccessful because the bench or the court says we do not find that um, you proved harassment to the requisite criminal standard i.e so that you are sure however we are happy that you proved it to the requisite civil standard balance of probabilities so we're going to acquit the person but we're still going to make the um, restraining orders so, you know, that's why I always say private prosecutions are a very handy tool. And people have used them for, you know, when the CPS haven't proceeded to rape um, trials and then the victim has just brought their own private prosecution and succeeded and people have been sentenced to very lengthy sentences. So, you know, the CPS certainly don't always get it right. But what about uh, proceeds of crime? If you are convicted of an offence that you somehow benefited, benefited from, then you can initiate proceeds of crime proceedings and that looks, at, that looks at two things what was your benefit from this offending and what are your re realizable recoverable assets in other words how much are we going to take off you but the way the benefit is calculated is it's effectively it's turnover it's not profit it's probably easier by way of an example um, you've got a skip hire business you lease a skip to some mates for 200 quid your skip lorry because you know they're basically going to use it to transport some stolen scrap or something like that as it happens the scrap that they stole turns out to be worth a hundred thousand pounds so you all get caught you get convicted what's your benefit well, you might say it's a 200 pounds no as far as the court's concerned it's the hundred thousand pounds um, because that's the amount of property that passed through your hands and you can go after everybody in the chain they do this with um, sort of drug proceedings you know there's ten thousand pounds of drugs some kid got 20 quid to cycle across the estate with it some other guy got you know some money to hide it in his house some other guy got some money to transfer where it was all distributed up you know they all make a hundred quid each maximum doesn't matter every single one of them is liable for the full value of the contraband material um, the way they do it is once they've identified potential income from crime the burden shifts it's for you to prove it's honest income it's not for the prosecution to prove that you obtained it dishonestly and trust me I, I, i've been on the receiving one, uh, end of one of these you spend a lot of time going through spreadsheets um but yeah they will go and say right okay and they can also assume that anything within the last six previous six years preceding the offense was the proceeds of crime i mean there are sort of all sorts of rules and technicalities about this but that's the general gist of it is once you are on the hook for proceeds of crime confiscation proceedings the burden pretty much shifts on you to prove that you you know the the income is legit and it won't now this is going to be very interesting for the post office because they'd have you know how can they show it's legit it's like well you've obtained all this money um and you have no entitlement to it so it's all illegitimate but you know they can look at the entire turnover 
and say, well, actually, this money coming in, that facilitated you staying in business, but for this money you weren't entitled to, you'd have had to get extra lending at you know, these rates, or you would have had to you know, go bust. Well, you know, that is a benefit in itself. So these things can be really, really harsh. But is that of any use to the sub postmasters? Because, you know, where does this money go when it's confiscated? It actually goes to the treasury. However, there have been cases um, where there have been private prosecutions that have continued to proceed of crime proceedings. And the prosecutor's done a deal with the government and they've agreed to split the uh, recovered assets. Um, Virgin Media did one on this. They went after loads of people bootlegging all their sort of, you know, software and films and things like that. And, you know, they, they basically initiated confiscated proceedings and they said, well, look, we'll keep a percentage of this and we'll give a percentage to the government. So we'll do all the legwork, um, but we want to keep some of the profits here. I mean, obviously, compensation and confiscation are separate things and courts can make compensation orders or usually though they're quite negligible you know the sort of when you know somebody gets assaulted and you might get like a hundred pounds or you know somebody vandalizes your car and you might get the cost of a new windscreen wiper so in this case where the proceeds arguably are going to be in like the tens if not hundreds of millions um then you know it's not going to be something where the Crown Court is going to say to the postmasters and we award you compensation of, you know, X hundred thousand pounds, everything you lost. That will be dealt with through one of the civil recovery schemes. So it might well be the postmasters go, well, there's nothing, there's no real benefit to us um, in doing this, you know, just doing the government's job for them. But then again, there might be an appetite to say the um, post office shouldn't be allowed to sit on top of their ill-gotten gains. So there you go. I will monitor this with interest and report back as I have more news. So where are we today? This is St Purin's Lost Church. Although clearly it's not lost because I'm, I'm sat in it. So where did it go? Well, um, it's a very, very early church. and There's an even earlier one that is actually now completely buried by the sand, a little bit over, about a mile over there. Uh, but because it kept getting encroached with sand, the parishioners decided, uh, actually, we had enough of this. So they just stripped off the church itself they left all the foundations but they stripped the church off and they rebuilt it uh, a few miles away and it's a place called St Purin Zabulo. Purin Zabulo means Purin in the sands. It's quite ironic actually because Purin Zabulo they took it there so it was out of the sands. <laughs> so what were they thinking I don't know. But anyway as always hope you found that vaguely useful vaguely interesting. If you did please consider liking sharing subscribing and all those YouTubey things.